what's going on everybody welcome you're tuned in to another episode of whistle kick martial arts radio and on today's episode i'm joined by dwight woods my name is jeremy lesniak welcome to the show thanks for spending some time with us if you're new to what we do two places i'm going to urge you to go first is whistlekickmartialartsradio.com everything that dwight and i talk about today we're going to have over there we're going to have a transcript from this episode we're going to have links and photos and videos and you know if we talk about things we'll, we'll throw all that stuff over there and make it easy for you and then if you want to go the full depth of all the things that we do to connect educate and entertain the traditional martial artists of the world that's whistlekick.com you're gonna find lots of great stuff over there you can use the code podcast15 to save 15 percent on any of our products but dwight dwight woods you're here thanks i for am being here i appreciate my pleasure it. my pleasure thanks for having dwight me. with one syllable <laughs> Dwight with one syllable, I'm, yes. I'm not even going to tell the audience why that's funny. <laughs> that's just going to be for you and I. Okay. But I appreciate you being here, and I, I don't. where do we start? We could start in so many ways. Where do you think we should start? This is an um, episode about you. Well, I was in uh, Denver, Colorado. Uh, well, actually, Greenwood Village, Colorado, uh, last weekend with my teacher, Dan Inasano. And um, there's a bit of a name drop. Yeah. How you like that? Right. <laughs> if you're going to, Hey, a, if he is if such a cool guy, if you're going to start, why don't you start you might, you with, might as, with, as heavy as you can, right? You might as well. Yeah. You're, you're, yeah. you're coming out swinging for the fences. All right. Yeah. And so he called me up and he had me demonstrating for the, for the, the attendees and what have you. Oh, and he just keeps, keeps making me go and go. And he goes, that's the Dwight. I remember. Oh. Right. Cause I've been with him for 40 years. Yeah, that's that's quite a compliment. Yeah, so you know, it, it's it's funny. Um, in in my mind, Dan and Asanto is is almost a, a litmus test for martial artists because if you know who he is, it says a lot about the training you've done, how long you've been training, and and I, I think even your attitude. Because here's a guy who. I mean, is there anybody who's less afraid to put on, put on a white belt and learn new things? Precisely. Yeah. And, and that's what I love about him so much. Actually, it's interesting that you say that, Jeremy, because I, I uh, yesterday, I think it was, I put up a post. So I, I had a screenshot of Bruce Lee's uh, day timer mm. from uh, July of 1967. Okay. So it's actually in Bruce Lee's To, to the kids, a day timer was a planner. It's like a Google calendar, but on paper. All right, please continue. Okay. And so because it's on paper, it's written in uh, Dan's birthday, uh, 8.30 p.m. L.A. Chinatown surprise birthday party. Right? That's now, the reason why I thought of that is because of what you just said. So there's some people commenting on Facebook, and they're like, who's Dan? Dan who? Who is this right? Dan guy? Yeah. Who who's Dan? And then uh, one guy who is somewhat of a noted um, martial art historian asked if it was Dan Inosano or Dan Lee. Because yes, mm. there were two two Dan's who are Chinatown students of Bruce Lee's, right? But I just thought it was it was interesting. In fact, I met Dan Inosano in 1983 on his birthday. Sunday, July 24th, How does that 1983. Um, I went out to UFC Irvine for a camp. Okay. Yeah. And it just happened to, you know, camp started on Monday the 25th and we flew in and it just happened to be his birthday. Uh, I wasn't aware of that at the time, but yeah. He was teaching on his birthday. Uh, he was, you know what? Uh, yes, I think because... I think that camp was four weeks long mm. and I flew in on week number two. Mm. So he had been at Irvine campus for a week already. Yes. So he had taught, that yeah. says a lot about this man. I, I, you know, I, I have not had the pleasure of training with him and, and in a moment I'm going to have you tell the audience, just give a, a quick synopsis of who Dan Inosanto is, because there are people who don't know who he is and we don't want okay. them to feel lost. Okay. But, you know, this is, this is a man, you know, I, I look up to, I look up to a lot of people and, and, and when you consider certain aspects of their personality or their training or whatever, I look up to pretty much everybody in some way, everybody's doing some cool stuff. Yeah. 
But when I look at someone like Bill Wallace, why do I love Bill Wallace? Because he's still training and he's still trying to get better. And he's sharing what he knows. And you can say the same thing about Dan Inosanto. He's yeah. still training. He's still trying to get better. He's still sharing what he knows. And I think, you know, because he, he's what, 82 now? Three? Bill Wallace or Inosanto? No, Dan Inosanto. Uh, Dan Inosanto will be 88 this year. Okay, I'm, I'm off. I'm off. Yeah. Okay, 88. Yeah. And he's still going. Yep. And how many people are still going at 88, let alone yep. alive? But they still have that itch to yep. keep training, getting better, sharing their knowledge. What's funny is that in 1983, I also met Bill Wallace at that camp because, yeah, because... Um, Here I am. I'm four and you're having the time of your life. <laughs> hey, I was 14. <laughs> but still, right? you know, 14 is pretty... pretty pretty early yeah. to get to hang with those guys <laughs> so um yeah because what we would do at camp like so whoever you signed up to train with you would train monday tuesday and wednesday and then thursday was switch day mm. so on thursday i got to train with bill wallace and um who else did i train with i forget and then we would cut training at noon and go to the beach for the rest of for the rest of the day and then and then come back later on in the afternoon camps like that don't exist anymore i i, I don't know if they do i i've i've never i've never heard of a camp where people are just you know where where the hanging out is worked in in that way that just that sounds awesome mm -hmm. yeah how there were 14 there were, how did you pull I, that off at 14 no that that's not true it's i'm i'm kidding i was oh, okay. 14 oh okay but people always try to work out how old I am. And the yes. truth is, I got confused. I got confused because it's either when I was 23 or okay. 32, my okay. students threw me a party and they switched to candles. So I have been confused ever since. Yes, I have been confused ever since. I have no idea how old I am anymore. <laughs> right? Awesome. So. Then, then, you, then you can't use age as a crutch. Ah, exactly. Exactly. It cannot be an excuse, yeah. you know? So it is, it's incumbent on you to do the best you can at the seminar in, uh, and this is something that he talks about even in classes at his school. Um, and I won't remember all of them, but he does talk about the six S's of martial art and included in that it's skill and strength and speed and stamina and spirit. And uh, I forget one of them, but what he's saying stance? is, is stance one of them? No, uh, hmm. no, because it's 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 more. Well, I, I I don't want to say it's um, like technique or whatever. It's more of of mindset and approach to things. Hmm. And and but and he's see. Here's the thing, Jeremy. Dan Asano has been on the seminar circuit, essentially for the past 44 years, okay? So let's say I did start training with him at 14. It means that I was 58 years old training with him last weekend. Yeah. So the crowd that attends an Inosano seminar now, almost every gathering he goes through and he, and he goes, okay, who here is over 20 and he goes all the way up to over 70. Yeah. Yeah. Because there are people over 70 years of age who are attending his seminars. That's Why? Great. Because a lot of them have been with him for over 30 years. Yeah. You know, so, so when he talks about that, he's, he's very often talking to the more mature individuals, right? Mm. At the seminar. Cause yeah, cause some of us have been with him for four decades. Wow. I promised the audience that I, I would ask you this. So if you had to sum up who Dan Inosanto is in a, in a couple sentences, how would you describe him? Oh, he's most famous uh, for being Bruce Lee's premier disciple. Mm -hmm. But he didn't just stop there. No. He's, he's not, he's not yeah, parading. But I, I tried to give flat. it to you and I tried to give it to you in one sentence. Yeah. Yeah. 
No, you're right. That that is that right. is why why he he became most famous. I I would say I would say that so we we have a saying that I um, co opted from some of the um, um, the the other podcasts that that I watch non martial art podcasts mm -hmm. right and my saying is I came for Bruce Lee but I stayed for Dan and Asano mm -hmm. you see because like millions of other people around the world I was influenced to take martial art more deeply because of Bruce Lee. Mm. And so when the opportunity to go meet and train with this guy who had spent time with Bruce Lee, as a Bruce Lee fan, I took advantage of that. But then, and my initial intention was to go spend two weeks, one week with Dan and Sano, Bruce Lee's premier disciple, and the second week with uh, Francis Fong, a, mm. big, uh, a Wing Chun um, uh, uh, instructor, because I knew that Bruce Lee had formally studied Wing Chun mm -hmm. and Dan Inosano was his top guy. So I figured I'll go out, I'll spend two weeks with these guys, and then I'll go back home to Barbados and I'll show my guys there what I learned. And that was going to be it. But it didn't turn out that way. I went home and I, I talked to my supervisor and I got mm -hmm. a few more days off and I called Jay D'Amato, who was the, the organizer of what we called uh, California Martial Arts Academy. That was the name mm -hmm. of the camp. And I called Jay and I go, Jay, how much will you charge me if I can come back out um, next week? He goes, Dwight, you came all the way from Barbados to California. If you can get back out here, don't worry. I won't charge you anything. Boom. Done. So I went back out, spent a third week. And um, then that just started a whole series of traveling back and forth from wherever I lived mm -hmm. because I, I traveled from Barbados to California as much as I could. And then uh, three years after meeting Dan in Asano, I did flirt with the idea of moving to California to be able to train with at his school, but that would not have worked out on the, on the professional side because my, 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 my line of work, I would not have gotten a shift where I could train mm. with him. So I did the next best thing, which was to move to Miami because I was very, very comfortable um, in Miami because I had been flying there for training and for, for work. I had been flying to Miami. What, so do, moved, what do you do or what did you do? I, w I was in the airline industry. Okay. Right. So, so I moved to Miami because we, um, we had two, if not three, daily nonstops, Miami to LAX. Yeah. So I could jump on one of those anytime I wanted to. Or I could even, I could fly, I could connect through Atlanta you know, or, or something. So, so I did that. And, um, so literally for 41 years, I have been traveling to train with him. Mm. And so it started in 83 and my most recent trip to train with him, we came home, uh, Sunday night, this past Sunday night. I know we're going to dig in more to you and Jeet Kune Do and Bruce Lee and Dan and Asanto and, and, and the subjects that come with that. But I want to go back to the before Dan and Asanto. Okay. Smaller chunk of your story. Okay. But I'm, I'm guessing just based on what you've put on the table, so to speak, you started training martial arts in Barbados. Yeah. Yeah. How did that happen? What did that look like? Why? All those questions. Well, I'm, I'm from the era of um, Kung Fu films. Hmm. And Hong Kong, British colony, mm -hmm. Barbados, former British colony, mm -hmm. we were fortunate enough to be on the receiving end of one of Hong Kong's major exports, AKA Kung Fu films. So in my, in, in, in my time, I had every couple of weeks, there was probably six new Kung Fu films that we could go watch. So I grew up on that stuff. And then one day I go to the movies 
and Bruce Lee starts fighting in the big boss. And I sit up in my chair and I go, what's this? this there was something different about him. Oh, completely different. You could tell right Completely away. different, right? Later on, I came to find out that the action director, the fight choreographer for the big boss, called back because they filmed in uh, Pak Chang village in Thailand, right? He called, they called back to Hong Kong to um, Raymond Chow to complain about Bruce Lee, that he didn't want to fight the way everybody else was fighting in Kung Fu films at the time, what I call long fist style, right? Because all the movements were big and all the fights were like 13 minutes long, right? And Bruce Lee goes, no, nah, man, I'm going to hit the guy once and he'll be out. And so they called, this is, this is my understanding, they called Hong Kong to complain and Raymond Chow says, do it his way. And the result was Big Boss, and proverbially, the rest is history. Yeah. So that that was that was my start. So a lot of what I did was self training. Now, let's see. Are you old enough or or um, well informed enough <laughs> to 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 recognize the name Bruce Tegner? Yes. Okay. So when you're from my generation, it's Kung Fu films and Bruce Tegner books. Mm -hmm. that you either steal or borrow or buy from the bookstore. Yep. There was a thing called a bookstore, right? <laughs> For all you kids. <laughs> it's, it's like a Kindle, but, but with, <laughs> with, with dead trees. <laughs> right. So, yeah, so that's how I started. And then because I, ne I needed to, to have training partners, so mm -hmm. I joined a local establishment called uh, Wushu Kwan, and I trained there, and I lasted about six months. Mm -hmm. because they got annoyed because every second word out of my mouth was Bruce Lee and uh, they didn't <laughs> they, they didn't quite like it so like I said to them I go um, uh, well we pay $20 a month to train here but all we ever do is kick and punch the air and Bruce Lee says that you got to have you know, like five different types of things. When you hit, you got to have a heavy bag. You got to have a paper target. You you know, you got to this, you got to that, right? You know, and but and the thing is that on my own at my house in my backyard, I had made a makiwara because even though even though I I, I ended up being a huge Bruce Lee fan, um, I was I was a martial artist. I was it, it wasn't just. Okay, I'm, I'm, my viewpoint is so limited, it's just Bruce Lee. No, I was a, I was a fan of martial artists. So I had, um, I had Master in Karate by Masutatsu Oyama. Mm -hmm. You know, I had um, um, uh, Karate Beyond Empty Hand by um, Shigeru um, Okami, mm -hmm. right? If I have the names, if the name's right. I, I, I mean, I, I ended up with, um, with books on Taekwondo, you know, everything that I could, you, that I you, could get my you, hands on. It was all good. You wanted all of yes. it. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Be because, because there was, you know, I got the sense from the beginning. Yeah. Bruce Lee did his own thing, but Bruce Lee was never saying it's just my thing. That's all that matters is my thing. No, 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 no. That was said the opposite. Exactly. Right. So, so from the get go, it was about being open-minded. It was about seeing what was out there that could be of personal benefit to you, mm -hmm. no matter where it came from. Exactly what he said in the fight scene, um, at, at the, the opening to the first fight scene in Way of the Dragon, when the, the restaurant kid says, ah, that's foreign. I, I, I'm only interested in Chinese boxing. And Bruce Lee says, if it can help you to protect yourself in a fight, then you should study it no matter where it comes from, yeah. you know? So he, 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 he did what he could to insert those important messages into the movies as well, hmm. you know? So, so yeah, so, 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 so that was it. I forget the question now. That's okay. okay. The, question, the questions aren't super relevant. Your okay. answers are, are, are for, <laughs> far more relevant than the questions. 
so you're, you're, you're training at this school yeah. and uh, you're asking too many questions about Bruce Lee and you leave? Well, no, I wasn't asking questions about Bruce Lee. I was telling them what Bruce Lee had said, okay. what he had written. Because um, I, was, I was in the magazines, I was in the books, right. you know, and, and what have you. And so they asked me to retire. And, and what happens then? Because obviously you didn't say, oh, I guess my martial arts career is done. No, my backyard became the meeting place for people from all the different styles on the island. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Right. And I used to go down to the Shotokan place and sit and watch. They let their, you. Their, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there was one guy who came over to me one time and he said, you're here more often than people who are members. Why don't you join? And I said, well, you know, it, it's it's not. What did I tell him? I think I said something like I wasn't ready, right? Mm. And 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 he said something like, oh, you you think you're better than us and this and that. And I'm like, man, you don't even know my name. I, on the other hand, do know your name. All right. Okay. So how dare you try to tell me who I am or what I think you don't even know what my name is. So that, but I, but one of the reasons why I was there was because I actually had sparring partners who were members Hmm. of the Shotokan school. So I used to meet with them on Sunday mornings before class started and out of respect, So we were the first people there. We got there like two hours before class started and we would spar, but I never sparred them on their training floor. We sparred in the bathrooms because to me, it would have been disrespectful, Mm. right? As a non-member of their Shotokan school to be up on their training floor, showing their people my stuff. So we, 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 um, relegated that to, to the bathrooms. This, this sounds like such a, a, a fun, maybe that's not even the right word, but that, that's the word I'm going to use, a fun time for you. Because yeah. this is, you know, we, we've, over the, over the course of the years with the show, we, we've had, you know, we've had plenty of people who were training in the 60s. I've read a bit about the folks training in the 50s, 70s, you know, all, all the way up through. And what seemed to have been happening and it started to fade towards the late seventies was this openness of what what he got, Mm -hmm. you know, that very open and accepting, Hey, you got something cool to share. Let's, let's share it. And I I didn't realize until many years later that, you know, when I started training as a a young kid in the eighties, my school was very much like that. And so that, that's a lot of where that philosophy for me comes in and it, it spiders into whistle kick and all the things that we do that, you know, I don't, I don't care. I don't care if you're Shotokan or Jeet Kune Do or, you know, catch wrestling. Like if you've got something to show me, I want to learn it. Yeah. It sounds like that's what you were doing down in Barbados. Well, I, I think, I think because that openness is built in to the JKD approach. That's part mm. of the Jeet Kune Do philosophy, right? right? You know, sure. so you, you, you'll go on the internet and you'll see, um, sometimes it's incorrectly worded, but you'll see absorb what is useful, reject what is useless, add what is specifically your own. And that quote will be uh, credited to Bruce Lee, which is incorrect. Mm -hmm. Bruce Lee never said that. Never. No, it, that actually, um, and it doesn't start at absorb what is useful. There's actually a sentence that precedes that, which is research your own experience. Mm. Okay. Now, um, there's a part of the story that I, that I might not have correct. Um, apparently there is, there's an edition of Sun Tzu's Art of War in which those words appear and they are taken from a book on warfare by Mao Zedong. Hmm. And so the part of the story that I'm not sure is how it ended up being a, 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 a dis, not a discussion, but an exchange between Dan and Asano and Bruce Lee. So I, I think I've heard that um, Bruce Lee gifted a copy of 
um, the art of war to Inasano. And Inasano, in reading it, came across those words and thought, this exemplifies Jeet Kune Do. And so he had a sign made, and you can see it in various documentaries and what have you. And it said, the truth in combat is different for every individual in this style. So that's at the top of the sign. And then there's the big Jeet Kune Do symbol in the middle. And then on the bottom, it says, research your own experience, absorb what is useful, reject what is useless, add what is specifically your own. And so that became, I, I actually call, I name that the four tenets of Jeet Kune Do. But it's not actually an original Bruce Lee statement. He didn't say it. Mm. It could be more attributed to Dan and Asano than to Bruce Lee. But just like there's another one online, very famous Bruce Lee quote, to hell with circumstances, I create opportunities. That's incorrect, right? The correct quote is circumstances. Heck, I make circumstances. That's actually the, the, the right, the, the, the actual one. But for some reason, it ended He's up- one of the most misquoted people. Oh and man. In the early days uh, of, of Whistlekick, uh, and actually I, I haven't heard from him in a while. Richard, if you're out there, you, you know I'm talking to you. He's a wonderful gentleman. He's been on the show and he would he would check us. He's like, Bruce Lee never said that. Right. Like I would get emails with screenshots. Uh, yep. Bruce Lee didn't say that. So it, it's, yep. you know, you could take pretty much anything that's imagined to be wise or philosophical and put his name on it and people will trust it because he's he's still held up not just because in yeah physical because, ability just seen as, right. as just this uh, I, I guess profit is probably the best word yeah yeah and you know look there's like most things in the world there's good and bad to that mm -hmm. because what's good about it is that the philosophy gets out there what's yeah. bad about it is when people start thinking that uh all of this originated with Bruce Lee. Okay, so I did find it. All right, so let me show. Let me, let me show you this. Yeah. All right. So, can you read that? Circumstances. Hell, I made circumstances. Yeah, that's the original quote. All right. Now, since we're talking about people assigning stuff to Bruce Lee, are you? Do you know this book? Who wrote the Tao? Who wrote no. the Tao? No, okay. I don't know that book. So this is written by James uh, Bishop. And James right. Bishop, uh, I think Who Wrote the Tao might be his third Bruce Lee book. And so what happened is in 1975, I think, is the original, 1975 is the original publication date of the Tao of Jeet Kune Do. I think it's 75. Let me see. Um, yep. Yeah. Because this, this is this is from 1975. And so what happened is that in the first printing, um, I forget who it was, but somebody pointed out to the publishers that a lot of what was contained is not originally written by Bruce Lee. Hmm. It was actually Bruce Lee's notes taken from other publications. And so they had to, they had to insert acknowledgements into subsequent printings of the Tao of Jeet Kune Do. Well, years later, James Bishop tracks down 85%, probably more by now, 85% of the origins of Bruce Lee's notes. Oh, all right. Okay, so you can read the, who wrote the Tao and put it on the table next to the Tao of Jeet Kune Do, and you can just cross-reference like this. Oh, that's fun. Right? Yeah. So it's... So it's you, can, uh, you can track it back to the original source material and get yes. closer to yeah. Bruce's understanding. Right. See, so so now the downside of that is that then the Bruce Lee detractors want to say, oh, well, he never had an original thought, but that's not true because his thoughts are his. Now, how many of us have had a thought that was never influenced by something that somebody else said? None of us. Right. Okay. Now, the thing about the stuff in the Tao is that Bruce Lee was making notes of stuff for his personal use, his personal consumption. 
He didn't know he was going to die at age 32 and posthumously become an international superstar and that people would be clamoring for everything they could get their hands on. And so decades later, John Little is able to produce what we re refer to affectionately as the Bruce Lee Library mm. because John Little was given access to, I dare say, all of Bruce Lee's notes. So these notes were taken from other sources, mm. but it was for Bruce Lee's personal use, not for publication. That was never his intention. That just ha happened to happen because he died, became a celebrity, and there's people like me who you put out, I don't care what it is, this is my latest acquisition. I have opened this, I have owned it for two weeks. I have opened it three times. Mm -hmm. Okay, because I'm not particularly interested in what's in it. I'm just interested in owning it because You're a collector. <laughs> I'm just interested in owning it because it's a Bruce Lee book. <laughs> right. right. Let, let me let me. I want I want to ask you a question because I think more than anybody else who's been on the show, you know, we we've had I mean, Bruce Lee's come up a, a million and one times years ago. I was, fortunate enough to have Matthew Polly on the show. We had a great chat. Yeah. And we've speculated often what might have been if mm -hmm. he hadn't passed early. And I'm sure that's a question you've asked yourself and you've probably talked about with other people, but I'm, I'm, I'm really interested to know your answer. So this is my guiding principle for what I call the what if questions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do not insert or inject your personal preferences into your answer about Bruce Lee and what if. So let's say I am a huge fan of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. My answer to what if Bruce Lee, one of my answers to what if Bruce Lee had lived, oh, he definitely would have trained with the Gracies. What is that based on? Nothing. Speculation. Right? Now, if we think about Bruce Lee's lifestyle, Bruce Lee didn't go anywhere to train with anybody. People came to him. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to play the what if game, then to me, it's more logical. So, well, the Gracies probably would have gone to see Bruce Lee. As opposed to, right, he would have. So, uh, but again, none of us know. None of us know. Right. So so that's one part of the, the, the what if. Then there's another aspect of the whole what if Bruce Lee had lived where um, I, I think the phenomenon is known as presentism, where you judge someone in the past based on present day standards. Mm -hmm. So that's where you get another group of Bruce Lee detractors. Oh, any um, any middle way in the UFC would have torn him to pieces. Based on what? Based on a guy who died in 1973? That, so, so you're going to look now at all the advancements in technology, all the advancements in training, and you're going to you're going to take his 50-year-old ability and put it up against modern and, day? And, and assume that the most open, potentially at least one of the most open-minded martial artists of his era would have ignored all of those things. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, so that, that, that is, uh, that is something that I get, um, I, I'm asked that fairly often yeah. and, and, and I do have to deal with, um, the Bruce Lee detractors, which is fine. I get it. Right. It's a different era, you know, for a lot of people, Bruce Lee was an actor, you mm -hmm. know, um, it's like, well, what's his fight record? Because today, since 1993, August 1993, and the, the, I think the debut of the UFC, everybody has grown up where, well, you only matter if you have a fight record. If it's martial arts, right? The only thing that matters is your fight record. So what's Bruce Lee's fight record? Oh, he, 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 he didn't fight. Zero and zero. To, right. Now, to his credit... Um, 
I thought what I would do is position myself with some of my library right next to me. Yeah, I, I could Just... tell what you were doing. You've got you've you've got resources <laughs> off camera. <laughs> It's like we're in a debate and you're, you're ready to just, bam, right. I win. So to his credit, John Little recently uh, put this out, oh, right? Okay. The Wrath of, of, for, for the, of, of the, the Dragon. For the listeners. Right. Wrath, Wrath of, of the, the Dragon, Dragon, The Real Fights of Bruce Lee by the John Little. The Real Fights of Bruce Lee, right? Okay. So like James Bishop, um, John and James have done incredible amounts of research, right, in order to um, get to the truth behind a lot of mm. Bruce Lee stories and, and what have you. So John, um, John Little made a, a record of uh, fights that we know that Bruce Lee did have. And then I think, I think in the end, let's see, I, I think at the back of it, he does like a, I think he does a, a, a fight record, like a scorecard or something. Let me see. Let me see. See if I was a real ardent Bruce Lee historian, I would know for sure. But I think it's how out. dare you not have all of these books. I know, memorized, right? right? I know. I know it's terrible of me. So yeah, so here it is. Um, let's see. It's towards the back of the airport, uh, the airport, okay. the back of the book, a yeah. snapshot of Bruce Lee's fighting and sparring record. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it details, it gives you the date, and the outcome and what have you. Yeah. yeah right. So it's like, um, it's uh, in 19, let's see, here's a good one. 1958, he's 17 years old. He's a, he's fight, he's a Wing Chun stylist. He, he fights a guy named Robert Chung in a place named Mirador Mansions and he knocks him out. Mm. Right. And so, uh, John Little does that from 1952 all the way up to, uh, let's see, 1973, mm -hmm. all right? And so his record is 34 and one. And then there's another thing where it's uh, sparring, sparring matches that he had with different people. Yeah. A, right? a few weeks ago on the show, we, we had a conversation we released an episode uh, about Joe Lewis and Joe Lewis's legacy. And we, we talked mm -hmm. a little bit about his relationship to Bruce Lee and, and mm -hmm. how... A, that was the Bill Wallace episode, correct? Yeah, it was Bill Wallace and yeah. Danny Dring were, yeah. were kind enough to, to talk about Joe. And because, you know, of, of the people that I'll never get on the show because they passed away, Joe Lewis is probably the one that I'm, I'm yeah. saddest about because I have so many friends who thought so highly of him. Yeah. But to talk about their relationship and how so much of what Bruce believed was, you know, kind of uh, um, passed to Joe to implement on a high mm -hmm. level in the ring. You know, it's just, it's, I think, you know, and, and, I, and I understand people's uh, desire to break someone down to a fight record. And, and maybe you'll disagree with me, but I think to, to boil Bruce Lee off to, a fight record to either justify or detract from what he he did. I, I think that does him a disservice. I think it does the world of martial arts a disservice because martial arts isn't just fighting, <laughs> right? Like, like if, right. if you if you want to if you want to learn to be the best fighter you can be, stepping into any traditional martial arts class is probably not the most efficient way to go. And if all Bruce Lee was, was a fighter or a, a near fighter, would we still be talking about him No, 51 years later? No, not at all. Not at all. Right. Um, so what I, so I don't take any of that stuff seriously when somebody is like, oh, Bruce Lee didn't have a fight record. Say, like, okay, fine. Right. Doesn't mean anything to me. Doesn't diminish his impact on my life, my way of thinking for the past 50 years, right? Not at all, okay? I think it's cute that um, we can take John Little's book and when somebody says, ah, oh, Brucey didn't have a fight record, we can flip to the pages and go, actually, his record was 32 and 0, <laughs> right? And they go, what do you mean? I go, well, and then you go into 
a, 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 a mini dissertation on, on John Little's book. I think that's funny. I think that's cute, right? That you could, that you, re, I could actually respond that way to someone. Um, but what a lot of people miss is that Bruce Lee trained like an athlete. Mm. You see, that's what they, so yeah, he never competed, but that doesn't mean that he didn't, that he wasn't competition ready at all times because he understood the value and the importance of being combat ready. Yeah. And so when, um, you know, when his path crossed with people like Joe Lewis, like Mike Stone, like Chuck Norris, like Louis Delgado, guys who were at the top of the martial art competition world, they saw something in Bruce Lee and they sought him out. And then I think to a man, each of them would say, yes, the time I spent with Bruce Lee definitely helped me in my competitive years. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I've found myself saying over the last few years is that there are, if you consider the instructor side of things, there are two kinds of martial arts instructors, those who pass on what they learned and those who advance what they learn. And I think when you, when you look, if, if that's your dichotomy, it's very clear why Bruce was special. It's very clear why he is still so memorable. You, you talk about the detractors and, and, you know, okay, fine. Maybe, maybe, maybe you are an amazing fighter. Maybe if, if he was to be resuscitated, uh, you know, cloned or something and brought now, and maybe, maybe you would be a better fighter, but you know what? You can go just about anywhere in the world, show a silhouette of this man mm -hmm. and he will be recognized and nobody knows who you are. And that's to me suggests an, an impact that be, is very difficult yeah. to describe. Yeah. It, it, it's because Bruce Lee is the one one in a million for the martial art world yeah. because he happened to come along at a time in the history of the world where people had started to question all of the established entities. Bruce Lee hit the scene in 1966 with the Green Hornet. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so when he did the interview um, with uh, Pierre Berton in 1970, I think it was, or 71, now, now I forget, right? And so Bruce Lee was a product of the 60s. And mm -hmm. so all of the profound utterances influenced by thinkers like Watts, thinkers like Krishnamurti, influence uh, uh, Suzuki and the, the Zen philosophy and that type of stuff. Bruce Lee's personal library at the time consisted of over 2,500 books. Mm. Okay. Um, you can find, awesome. yeah. You, and, and I think through the efforts of people like James Bishop, you can find most of those titles. I, I, think, I think you can find most of them. Um, online, but maybe not all 2,500, maybe not, but a, a, a substantial amount of them you can find, you can find online and you'll see, right? There was, um, obviously I would say the majority of them, the highest percentage was martial art books, but then there were books on, on filmmaking. There were books on personal development. There were books on finances Right. All that, all that type of stuff, because like Linda Lee said in an interview, he was a self-taught man. He was a self-created man, which is why part of his philosophy is what? That Jeet Kune Do, one of the purposes of training in Jeet Kune Do is to use it as a vehicle towards personal expression, to use it as a vehicle towards self-actualization. That's the key. That's why he, that's why we talk about him 50 years later. Because that's part of his message, as opposed to, yeah, uh, beat up as many people as you can and make a name for yourself, right? Doing that. Nah, eh, not so much. 
let's, I mean, we, we could, we could spend all day talking about Bruce Lee, especially because I, I, I know it's, it's a, I can see, right. You're smiling now. It's, it's a subject that is, is one of your favorites, but I want to talk about this sort of, I'm going to call it a handoff mm-hmm. from Bruce Lee to Dan Inosanto. Okay. Because I think, you know, when, if, if you, if you look at the two of them through that, that, that dichotomy that I offered, you pass on martial arts or you advance martial arts. Bruce Lee advanced martial arts. Yes. Few people would disagree with that. But when you have someone who is that one in a million in any industry, there are a lot of people who take a very simple path and they kind of ride on the name of the person who made them who they are, or, or at least got them started. It, 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 I think it is again, a rare person who says, Bruce Lee got me started. I was his, his chief disciple. And I'm not simply going to compartmentalize what he gave me. I'm going to continue to advance things. Mm-hmm. And I think that speaks to the, the rarity of the type of person that Dan Inosanto is. Yeah. And, you know, at, at some point I'd love to have him on the show, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, if you can help make that happen. But <laughs> as the person who is, is closest to him, who has been on the show, can you speak to your understanding of this man and why he was willing to to take what was passed to him and not leave it alone because i can only imagine there were times early when you know bruce lee's name is here and dan Inosanto's name was not as prominent that people said why are you doing this why are you changing what this man did um well let me let me make sure let me make sure i i i understand what, what you're sure. saying so you said bruce lee's name was prominent and Dan and Asano's name was not. I'm imagining in 1973, you know, there's quite a gap between the two of them in terms of, of how people saw them. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong. You know, this is before my time, but I'm guessing. Well, I'm, tr- I'm trying. I'm uh, uh, shoot. I did this one. I didn't. I didn't. Pick I wasn't up. trying to stump you. No, no, no. I'm trying to think. Um, Dan and Asano's first appearance in Black Belt Magazine. Hmm. I don't want to get this wrong. I don't want to get this wrong. I think he appeared in Black Belt Magazine before Bruce Lee passed away. Okay. I think. Okay, so maybe so maybe the gap wasn't as wide as I think there might have been there might have been I could be wrong about this Jeremy. I okay. could be wrong, but I think there was an article on Inasano um Keeping the flame in 72 before Bruce Lee passed away. I could be wrong, right? But so there were people in the martial art industry who were aware before Bruce Lee passed away of Dan and Asano and his connection. Because uh, the LA Chinatown School opened up after the cancellation of the Green Hornet, because Green Hornet lasted only uh, one season. Mm -hmm. So after the cancellation of the Green Hornet, um, they opened up on College Street in Chinatown in in Los Angeles. And Dan and Santa was put in charge. So he led, he, so the way he says it, um, it's like uh, he taught, 90% 90% of the classes, Bruce Lee taught 10% because Bruce Lee would come in like on the weekends or, or what have you and check up on people and, and, mm-hmm. and spar people and what have you. So Inasano taught 90%, Bruce Lee taught 10% and Inasano assisted him in the 10% that he taught because Inasano never missed a class during the two, the two years or so that the Chinatown school was open. So this is 1967 up until 1970. So if there, so in the martial art world, there definitely were people who associated the two of them. Now, when Bruce Lee leaves uh, the the LA and goes to Hong Kong, he says to Inosano, well, take the most dedicated people, train them in your backyard. So that was going on also. So again, within the industry, 
there would not have been any separation. And okay. then that means that there was a limited number of martial artists who were also aware of the connection. So Joe Lewis, Louis Delgado, Mike Stone, Chuck Norris, all those guys would be aware of the Dan and Asano Bruce Lee connection. In fact, so I told you I worked in the airline industry. Yeah. So when Chuck Norris started to become popular, he was on the way. He was he was coming through Miami, heading down to uh, the Puerto Rico area. And uh, I worked in in what was called special services. And so my uh, my my supervisor says to me, he goes, OK, you're a karate guy. When Chuck Norris comes in, take him to the Ionosphere Club, which is like the, the, the lounge for the first class passengers or what have you. And um, and just just stay there with him until it's time for him to board his connection. So I meet Chuck Norris. I take him to the lounge and we sit down and we start talking martial art. Mm -hmm. Right. And. He's kind of like, oh, uh, I got to talk to this kid and you know, whatever, whatever, whatever. And then I mentioned that I'm Dan and Asano student. And it changed for him. Changes. Changes mm -hmm. completely. Changes completely because of that. Right? That happened to me again um, in 1993 when Mark DeCascos came to town to do a movie called Only the Strong. Love that movie. Okay? When he discovers that I'm Dan and Asano student, takes me off. And every, every and and we're we're out having a conversation by ourselves, mm. right? Because Mark, ticket. yeah, Mark and I actually um, almost met eight years previously in Trinidad. He was supposed to come down to Trinidad to be part of a demonstration, and you might recognize this name for G. Anthony Joseph. Hold on. Y yeah. <laughs> Do, do you know this is happening? Okay. Are you psychic? So for the audience, that's my next interview. Okay. Apparently, you know things that I don't know. So that's okay. fine. keep going. All right. So, uh, so yeah, Mark DeCascos was supposed to be part, to be part of that demonstration yeah. that Dan and Asano was flown down for. And they flew Dan and Asano down on my airline, right? And in those days, to get to Trinidad from Miami, you had to lay, you had to stop in Barbados. Mm. Okay, so I went down to Trinidad to be part of that demonstration oh, with my teacher, and that's where I met G. Anthony Joseph in 1985. Oh, what a ride! Yeah. <laughs> you, you. So here, here, I want to shift gears now. Because I, I, you know, we've spent just enough time together now. I can, I, I feel pretty comfortable saying you're a humble person, right? And, and the number one way I can tell is, is uh, when someone makes it about everyone else, which I, I think is, is common in the martial arts, but you, you, you're, you're, you're paying so much respect to these people who have come before you and, and, and singing their praises and, and really honoring them. And I appreciate that. And I, I'm sure most of the audience does as well. But I want to make sure we get some time talking about you, right? We've talked about your connections with these people, but I want to—I want to talk about what makes you tick, right? I want to talk about, you know, you—you sp you said I think you said you came back Sunday from training with yeah. Dan. Yeah. When you come back, you're thinking about things and you're doing things, and and I suspect you're also working to advance what you've been given. Yeah. So talk, talk to us about that side of you, you know, your, your contributions to the martial arts world, your thought processes. If I was to come train with you, if I was your student, what would you be teaching me? I'm going to, I'm going to borrow this phrase from the guy I refer to as my favorite Jeet Kune Do senior. Okay. And this is a guy named Cass Magda. And Cass Magda, I've heard that name. yeah, so just as Dan and Asano is, is, is unique in the martial art world as Bruce Lee's premier disciple, Cass Magda is unique in the Jeet Kune Do world because he spent um, uh, eight years, 16 hours a day, 
with Dan and Asano. Mm. And so we were at, um, we, we were, my, my training partner and good friend, uh, Ron Goldstein and I were at Cass's Sila camp, uh, um, last month or the month before, I forget when we, tra we travel a lot. We we're, we're, we're on the road, like at least once a month. And, um, and I asked Cass, what would you say is the most important thing you got from Inosano? And Cass said, learning how to learn. Okay. So what makes me tick? I absolutely love working on ways to take from pile A and pile B and bringing them into what I'm already doing. Hmm. How does this thing enhance? So really it is as literal as possible, the application of the four tenets of Jeet Kune Do. Research your own experience, absorb what is useful. My other favorite um, Jeet Kune Do senior, Chris Ken. Chris um, called, he, 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 I mean, he does follow the wording exactly, but he has, um, at times he has said, instead of absorb what is useful, more like absorb what is personally suitable, hmm. right? Reject what is personally unsuitable instead of absorb what is useful. But see, in doing that, Chris is actually applying the Jeet Kune Do philosophy because nothing in Jeet Kune Do is supposed to stay exactly the way it was back whenever. We are all supposed to take it in absorb it. So it's like, it's the difference between absorbing something versus adopting. See, adopting is not absorbing. So it's like, oh, I like that technique. I'll adopt it. Right? I'll put it into what I'm doing. That's not absorption. You see, because you don't absorb a technique, you absorb the art that that technique comes from. It's the whole thing about going deep mm. into something. That's what Dan and Asano has done. That's what Cass Magda has done. That's what I try to do as much as possible. You go as deeply as you can. Now, I don't have the access that Dan and Asano has to different systems under the top notch instructors in those systems. So I'm not able to go as deeply as you can, but what I can go deeply into is my own mind based on the information, right? And the, the, the learning that I have gotten from my instructors, I can go as deeply as possible into my own mind. So, so for example, one of the things I got from Kat, so that whole learning how to learn, it means drill down, drill down, drill down, drill down until you have gone so far down, you've gone so deep, there's nothing else that you can think about. Hmm. And, and you could do that with one technique. Okay. Then you, you could do that with, so, so now here, here's what you do. Here's, here's a template. Everybody knows about Bruce Lee's famous um, five ways of attack. Single, um, or, uh, simple direct attack or simple angular attack, attack by combination, attack by drawing, progressive indirect attack, and um, immobilization attack. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Now, let's limit ourselves to empty hands training. So we've got five ways of attack. And we have four skills of empty hands. There's kicking, there's punching, there's trapping, there's grappling. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we start. Um, personally, I would not use Excel because I hate Microsoft Excel. All right, simply because I don't know how to use it. I, and my brain just doesn't. Work. But but you do that. So now you look at your you look at your kicking arsenal, and you're starting to determine what what kicks are good as an attack, as an entry technique, 
Okay, so we got five ways of attack. We got four skills of empty handed combat. And then we have what I call the stages of combat, the three or four stages of combat, entry, follow up, finish. So now we got these. So, so this is how we build a template. This is how you learn to be creative in your own right. So I'll give you another aspect of the template. Okay, so we have five ways of attack. Um, four skills of empty handed combat, three stages of combat. And now we have the element of this. You can change the timing. You can change the angle. You can change the, the weapon. Okay. Hmm. Right. There's one more. Now my mind draws a blank because I'm okay. talking too much. <laughs> no, you're <laughs> You've got to talk, otherwise, I, otherwise it's <laughs> right. me. And... Um, the placement, timing, tool, angle. Yeah, that's it. Placement, timing, tool, angle. Now, using those four um, guidelines, people could come up with so much stuff, and that's just empty hands. Now, take that and do it all over again with weaponry. This is what Cass Magda means. This is what he got from Dan and Asano, learning how to learn. This is what I also got from, from that because I walked, in, I walked into that training room on Monday, July 25th, 1983. And the way I remember it, Dan and Asano and Cass Magda started doing double stick and I was like, that's it. That's what I want. It wasn't, whoa, I thought he's Bruce Lee's number one. Why isn't he doing what I saw Bruce Lee do in the movies? Because I wasn't there for that. I was there to hang with the guy that Bruce Lee appointed, right, mm -hmm. as his top guy. I just wanted to, to see what that was about. So I, I'm going to, I'm going to attempt to, to answer your question, the question I asked you earlier, because you, you've, I think you've given me the answer. The question was, you know, what, what was it about Dan and Asanto that he was comfortable? He was willing to continue to advance and not remain. And what I'm hearing from you is because that's what Bruce taught him to do. Yes that what Bruce Lee taught Dan and Asanto that was most special was not the techniques, it was the philosophy. And that was a very nice way of you saying I never answered your question. <laughs> Nobody ever answers my questions on this show. That's, that's, what, we, that's what we do. It's just, it, right? they're not questions, they're conversation starters. Yeah. Yes, um, so now no, part of the reason why in Asano has, um, he didn't get himself in trouble, but I'll express it that way because it's it's, because it's, it's a joke for people like me. Okay. One of the reasons why Dan Asano got himself in trouble in the Jeet Kune Do world is because he refused to try to, to link everything that he did and everything that he is back to Bruce Lee. Mm -hmm. And the small-minded people criticize him for that sure. because the small-minded people think this, if you learned from Bruce Lee, you don't need anything or anybody else in the world because Bruce Lee, to use a modern day um, terminology so people know I'm cool, Bruce Lee was the GOAT, right? So if you had the honor of meeting him in 1964, and knowing him for almost 10 years until he passed away. How dare you hmm. talk about Filipino martial arts? How dare you talk about Penjak Silat? How dare you introduce the world to Filipino martial arts, to Indonesian Penjak Silat, to French kickboxing, to Japanese shoot wrestling? Right? How dare you? You hung with Bruce Lee. We just want Bruce Lee, more Bruce Lee, more Bruce Lee, more Bruce Lee. What the hell? You think you're honoring Bruce Lee by approaching it that way? 
Bruce Lee said, be yourself. It's about self-actualization. It's about personal expression. How can Dan and Asano's personal expression be Bruce Lee, Bruce Lee, Bruce Lee? But the small-minded people, here's what they love to hear. Oh, all I teach you is what I got from Bruce Lee. <gasps> oh, I'm in heaven. All you're going to do for me is to show me what you got from Bruce Lee. How limited is that? Right. So there's this whole other vast, this expanse available to you. And the guy whose um, slogan says, use in no way as way and have in no limitation as limitation, you are going to limit yourself. Okay? Yeah. But to each his own. That's the way of the world. So there are people who are going to be in awe if somebody says, all I do is what I got from Bruce Lee. Well, what if all you do is 5% of the 10% that you got from Bruce Lee? That's nothing right. when you consider what the world of much. Do you really think that Bruce Lee would be would would be it's so stupid he would to limit yourself to evolve to that. exactly yeah dan dan and asanto on his best day at his you know whatever his peak is or or will be or was is a, a uh, an approximation of bruce lee at best but he's the best dan and asanto there will ever be well i'll tell you this here's what here's something that that he never talks about, right? So I talk about it sometimes. Dan and Asano, in college, was, I think it's 9-6, was a 9-6 100-yard sprinter. Okay? Wow. Okay. At five foot... For, for people who don't run track, that is fast. Yeah. At five foot four or five foot five and a hundred and twenty five pounds or whatever, he was the leading ground gainer for his college football uh, team. Wow. Okay. And at five foot four or five foot five or whatever, he also, what, what's the phrase? What's the American phrase? Lettered? I think he lettered in um, basketball. Okay. Yep. Okay. So, Inasano was a physical phenomenon as well. Now, I am not saying, because somebody will hear this and they'll go, oh, there's Dwight trying to, as, as we say in the islands, big up Inasano, right? No, that's not what I'm trying. I'm just pointing out that there might have been some, for lack of a different expression, attraction between Bruce Lee mm -hmm. and Inasano, when Bruce Lee goes, oh, this kid's physical, right? There's like a four-year, like. yeah, there's a four-year difference, yeah. okay, right? So then when Inasano hooks up with Bruce Lee and introduces Bruce Lee to track shoes, because Bruce Lee used to wear like these combat boots and what have you, and mm. Inasano introduced him to, you know, what, what we would call sneakers, right? Like track shoes, right? Um, in Asano, for training with Bruce Lee, he had the idea, well, these blocking shields that we use in football, let's use those for kicking. Is that where we got that? Was yes. Was in in football? I had no idea. Oh, that's yes. super cool. Oh, yes. What a, what a riot. Right? Then the focus mitts, yeah. in Asano introduced those to Bruce Lee. Be, because of the British boxers, mm -hmm. okay? In fact, Jeremy, in the early days of Inasano traveling to teach seminars, he used to take a duffel bag full of focus mitts because they were not Nobody else standard. Had. Yeah. Okay? Oh, um, the arm shields that they use also for blocking in football, mm -hmm. those became the kick shields. In fact, if you, if you remember... The, uh, the back of the restaurant scene um, when 
Bruce Lee is introduced, when, when Chinese boxing is introduced to the restaurant workers, those yellow arm shields that the guy that Bruce Lee kicks, those are the original mm -hmm. from LA Chinatown. Oh, funny. Right? The air, the, the, the air shield that he kicks in that scene also, all that stuff, those ideas came to Bruce Lee through Dan and Asano because of his time spent in athletics. Mm. So there was a symbiotic relationship between the two. Yes, there was instructor and student. But remember that Inosano is four years older than Bruce Lee, right? So even though there was, there, there was, it wasn't as simple as mm. one's the teacher, one's the student, shut up, not, there, nothing. No, it wasn't that. They were also, they were also friends, right? You know, pe people talk about, oh, well, it looks like if we look in the notes, um, this guy was there at, at, at Bruce's house more than anybody else. Yeah, and the reason why it appears that way is because you didn't have to write in that Inosano was there because he was there all the time. Right? So Inosano didn't have appointments to come over. He was there all the time. So nothing had to be written in. You mm -hmm. see? So, so, but this is why. Somebody will hear this and they'll think, oh, there he goes again. It's all fun and games for me. The way people get their clothing twisted into bunches over all this stuff. Who cares? Yeah. Who cares? The only reason, Jeremy, that we have these online fights and debates and discussions is because Bruce Lee died prematurely and posthumously he became an international superstar. When you realize that that is the cause of it, you stop fighting over him because it's dumb. <laughs> when I see people that have that much time to argue online, <laughs> my thought is you have more time to train. So shut up and get yeah. back in the gym. Yeah. You know, well, no, now, so I say that, but tomorrow I'll do um my my weekly wednesday podcast and then on yeah, friday sure talk about your show. on friday I'll, do, I'll i'll do my my friday podcast so so you know i'm sure there's somebody out there who goes well dwight's a hypocrite because he's always saying that that these debates are stupid but he's somebody who talks about this stuff every week yeah there's a di there's a big difference between uh investing time and energy in the opinion of someone that you will never meet and you have no interest in knowing who they are as a person on a Facebook post or whatever and trying to convince them of your opinion versus you as someone with knowledge and understanding and access to first person sources talking about these subjects. That yeah. is dramatically different to me. And if someone can't understand that that is not an equivalency, then, um, well, you know, the, the Wednesday podcast, the Wednesday yeah. podcast. Let's talk about called... your shows and because okay. I, I've got a feeling that, you know, quite a few audience members are going to want to check out what you, what you're doing. So yeah, let's okay. talk about well, that. Now, first things first, we're nowhere near as professional as you guys are at Whistlekick. Okay. You right? think this is professional? Yes. Because you have audio version, you have, uh, you use Riverside that does you chapters. Use Riverside. Uh, well, I, I will. After, after this, it's a, pretty, it's, a pretty good tool. it's a pretty good tool. Yeah. Right. Uh, I mean, because I, I started was, I think we're going into our sixth year and mm -hmm. literally all we did was to push go live on Facebook. It's a great on, way to get started on the iPhone. That, that was it. Yeah. Right. You know, so, so we don't have, um, we don't have the audio version, so you can't find us on Spotify or wherever else it is. Not well, yet. If that's but, something that you want to you want to talk about, you know, offline. Be oh yeah. Happy. After hanging out with you guys. Oh yeah. Right. Yeah. So the I Love Jeet Kune Do broadcast live stream, and again, I live stream because I I want to be upfront with people, warts and all. Right. It's a different you know? kind of format. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So we live stream, and. On Wednesdays, I talk to the camera about something. 
Mm -hmm. Right. So um, if I could if I can pull it up quickly here, if my computer cooperates with me, I think um, this with tomorrow's episode is going to be let me see. And, and your episode's going to come out in a couple weeks. So. Yeah. Okay. So, so at the time of recording this with you, yeah. um, it's going to be, are you Jeet Kune Do confused yet? Right. And here's how I come up with oh, these you, topics. You didn't, you didn't call it Jeet, Con, Jeet Confused because that's what I, I, I like. I like forcing contractions. Now, when you see that change, when you see that change, Two, two weeks from now, right? Everybody will know where it came from. Jeet confused. I will, Jeet confused. Yes, I will make a shirt out of it. Make some money. Ah, this is why I'm hanging with you guys. Right? You know, so, yeah. So that is the I Love Jeet Kune Do broadcast on Wednesdays, 6 p.m. Eastern time. And where I do talk, people find that? With on There's a YouTube channel called okay. the I Love Jeet Kune Do broadcast. And then okay. it's at Dwight D. Woods on Facebook. Okay. Right? Those are where the two live streams go. On Fridays, I do the Jeet Kune Do Dialogues, which is like what you and I are doing, where mm -hmm. I interview, I refer to them as Jeet Kune Do Notables. What I realized when I started this, there were people who actually said to me, well, why do you want to talk to me? I'm not famous. And I'm they like, say that to me. That was the first 50 episodes. So I tell them, here's what you got to realize. Every life has a story. Every story has a message. I want your Jeet Kune Do story, your Jeet Kune Do message. Because for me, a guy's Jeet Kune Do story, more often than not, is his life story. Any martial artist story. Right. People don't stay in martial art all their lives. And, and it's separate. It's so separate and distinct from what. It, you know what I mean? You'll make it long doing that. Yeah. Yeah. So and I will talk to anybody from any Jeet Kune Do camp. If you think Dan and Asano is the greatest thing since sliced bread, I'll talk to you. If you think that Dan and Asano is the worst thing since sliced bread, I'll still talk to you. I don't hide the fact that I'm a 40-year in Asano student. Everybody knows that. But by being willing to have a conversation with somebody who is not in the Inasano lineage, in the Inasano camp or whatever, I do that so you understand what my approach and my instructor's approach is, which is everybody has some kind of merit, yeah. you know, and you don't get anywhere just sticking to one way and one thing. I'm with you. You know, All right? It, it's, it's like my business mentor, the other Dan in my life, Dan Kennedy, says the worst number in marketing is one. You know, if, if, if you, if we just have, we have no backup system, we have just one system for producing our podcast and no backup system. One day you're going to regret that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. And to the, to the folks out there, if you, if you don't know who Dan Kennedy is, just as, you know, Dwight's here talking about going back to original, you know, we've talked to the, there you go. Uh, the no BS guide to succeeding in business. If you want to go back to some of my first person sources for the things that I know and the things that I teach, Dan Kennedy's on that list. Yeah. I spent um, 10 years with him. Oh, cool. Okay. And um, he and I became, I don't want to say we became fast friends, but at conferences, he would make a point he, he from the stage he would he would point me out, right? Oh, that's yeah, quite an and honor. and be, and before um, before the big conference would start, we'd have a reception, and you could very often find me and him off in a corner having the, these conversations. That's really and, special. And one of the reasons was Bruce Lee. 
Mm. One of the reasons was Bruce Lee, because here's the thing, right? So for those who know, Dan and Asano, highly influenced by Napoleon Hill. Mm. For those who know, Napoleon Hill's book, Think and Grow Rich, that's where you get in, in well, you, do, you get it in Think and Grow Rich, but you also get it in Secrets of Success. Um, the Napoleon Hill concept of definiteness of purpose, otherwise known as definite chief aim. Mm. Now, if you've never gone on the internet and done a search for definite chief aim, do it. And I guarantee you what will show up is Bruce Lee's copy, his handwritten note entitled My Definite Chief Aim. So when I introduced that to Dan Kennedy, a Napoleon Hill student, and showed him that Bruce Lee was also a Napoleon Hill student, I was in, just like I was in with Mark Dacascos when I said, and Chuck you know, Norris, right? <laughs> you know, when you came on, we're, we're going to start to fade here. We could, we could go all day. I know we could. When you came on and, you know, you're Dan and Asanto, I, I, I just figured, okay, so, you know, there's the home run at the beginning of the show. We'll keep people hooked and, you know, we'll, we'll end up talking about Dwight's life. But no, what you've managed to do is work in just about every big name <laughs> you could have. And, and you're doing something that very few people have done on this show, which is now you're dropping names in other industries. Now you're like, oh, you know, I hang out with Dan Kennedy. Yes. And you know why, I Jeremy? That, you you, you want to know why? Okay. So you want coincidences? I, I, I know why, but I want to see okay. what you say because so, I've, got a, I've got an opinion. Dig this. My first live event with Dan Kennedy was in 2006, March 2006, in Denver, where I just came from, mm. okay? And then two weeks later, we're in, I think we were in Georgia. Mm -hmm. And here's what he and Bill Glazer teach from the stage. Look at what's going on in other industries and see how you can apply it to your industry. Yeah. Hmm. Look at what other people do in other martial art methods and see how it could have. You see why I was happy? I do. I do. <laughs> I do. But here's what I'm going to say about you. You can tell a lot about a person by the company they keep. And if you've been able to maintain a relationship with someone like Dan and Asanto for a long time, if you were able to create a relationship with Mark Dacascos and Dan Kennedy. This, this, more than anything else you could have told us today, says something about you. And I'm so thankful that you, you came on the show. Um, to the audience, actually, no, before we do that, run down all the places people are going to find you. We'll have you do that first. Um, Websites and, and social media and all that good stuff. So the, the website is unifiedmartialart.com, okay. no S, unified, not united, unified. It means to become one. So that's the philosophy. Your training makes you become one. So unified martial art. But don't go there because the website's down for some unknown reason. Okay. There's something with hosting and what have you. So right now, Facebook, Dwight mm -hmm. D. Woods, Instagram, Dwight D. Woods, and uh, YouTube, there's three channels. Miami Jeet Kune Do, the I Love Jeet Kune Do broadcast, and the Jeet Kune Do dialogues. Okay. That's, that's, that's about Great. it. And, and I, I really hope folks in the audience take the time to check out your stuff because you're doing really, really cool things. And I'm so thankful that you're willing to come on and talk. And I'm going to throw it back to you in just a moment to close us up, your, your final words <laughs> for, for our conversation today. But audience, go check out Dwight's stuff. And remember why we do what we do. We're here to connect, educate, and entertain. And the goal overall is to get everybody in the world to train for six months, whatever it is. Because if you're like me, you believe that martial arts brings out the best in us. And so the world could use a little bit of betterment. So let's get more people training. Let's keep them training. And if you want to support us in our mission, if you've got a school, Whistle Kick Alliance. Uh, if you don't, maybe check out our Patreon. And if nothing else, go to whistlekick.com and see all the other things that we do besides the show. We've got the show, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, but we've got a whole bunch of things there. And remember, most of what we do for you is free, and that's it by design. 
Dwight, I really appreciate you being here. This has been a ton of fun. And, you know, you're, you're making me rethink our format. Maybe we need four hour recording blocks. <laughs> <laughs> My friend, how, how do you want to close us up today? Um, I, I'll, I'll leave people with this. This is something that I, um, when I ran my school, because I ran a school for almost 30 years here mm-hmm. in Miami. And um, through the time spent with Dan Kennedy, I realized that you had to formulate your own messages. And so one message I came up with is, is this. The art of self-defense is actually the art of self-development. You see? So that's one thing. We do that using Jeet Kune Do as a vehicle for personal development. So if you think about it, self-defense, self-confidence, self-reliance, mm. self-development, self-actualization, all these things. I used to do that with kids that were interested in joining my school. I'd go, okay, so you're here for self-defense, right? And then I'd write on a piece of paper the word self hyphen three times and give it to them. Come up with three more words that start with the prefix self, Hmm. right? This is for the kids. I should have done it for the adults too, but I did it for the kids. And, And then I would say, and if you can't come up with it on your own, mom and dad can help. Invariably, what are mom and dad going to do? They're going to put self-discipline. You know it, right? That's going to be one of them. So then I explained to them that martial art training can help to develop these qualities or it can help to enhance. If your kid's already pretty disciplined, training with me, I'm going to enhance that quality in him or her, right? And then the last thing is in this self-development, this world of self-development, four areas, physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual. And my belief is martial art is, will definitely physical, that's self-explanatory, emotional, because we all have the ups and downs. There are some days where as an instructor, you don't want to teach. As a student, you don't want to train. Get yourself in gear, change your mind, change your thinking. So mental, Well, besides what you do physically, you should read about martial arts, you know, I mean, any, any area, right? You should read and you should think about it. And my theory, unscientific and unproven, is that if you have physical, emotional and mental development happening simultaneously, then there is a spiritual development of some nature. That's it.